teased my whole life that I was going to marry Warren Jess. When I turned 18, my father, he's like, come on, we're going on a ride. I got in the car, and he's like, I turned you in this morning. And he had written a letter and recommended me that very morning. And then I was called. Are you uh, Warren Jeffs? Yes. Texas jury has convicted polygamous sect leader Warren Jeffs of child sexual assault. Jeffs is serving a life sentence for sexually assaulting underage girls he considered brides. Prosecutors use DNA evidence to show Jeffs fathered a child with a 15-year-old girl. And during the court proceedings, they played an audio recording of what they said was him sexually assaulting a 12-year-old in what his church calls spiritual marriages. Although he's behind bars, the teachings of Warren Jeff still remained ingrained in this sheltered society. Warren Jeffs is, oh, he's mean. He's, he's not really all the way there. He's like, he's like so psychotic. He started asking me, what, how do you feel? What do you want? How's that, you know, how's it, you know, all this stuff. And Warren told me that this is what the Lord wanted. And, he knew he had seen me and knew what was going on and all this stuff. I was really scared because at that time, I was really, really innocent. You know, I didn't know anything about marriage, really. My mother never sat down and gave me an education. I had in my mind, because I had a sister older than me, that was married to him, too. He was given these sermons that were really scaring me, too, because he was so strict. You know, you have to obey all the commandments or you're guilty of the whole and all these really straight things, you know. And he, he was like, I was just like going in shock. And he got up there one day and said, if you need more time, I'll let you go to a house in hiding. I'll let you go to a place where you can prepare further. A house in hiding is a house where there's a caretaker with the family, a man over the house. It's just in the middle of some city somewhere, the, you can't go outside most of the time unless it's like clear out in no, no, no man's land. You just stay there and pray and read until you're accepted back to the land. And he told me, he says, I just want you to go and write a confession letter. We've been out, this will, I think this will be the fourth year. Pretty freaking hard. My dad, and he has married Mother Rachel, Mother Anne, and my mom. So you never know how we're related, just like, oh, we're related. Yeah. So. so all the underlined ones are out. So Sandra, Carlene, Sarah, Rachel Ann, Laura, Alice, Andrea, Andrea died. Carol, Lydia, Melanie, Julia, Hiram, Daniel, Mark, Nathaniel, Diana, and Marie, and Susie and Rosie are all in. Order is something that the, I guess, the priesthood, so you'd call it, came up with. They call you in and pretty much evaluate you. And if they find you worthy, you get baptized into it. Our caretaker, my brother, he called me and he told me to pack a change of clothes and we were going on a, to do a priesthood project. Then it hit me that we were actually going to be baptized into this order. 
Then they took us into a room full of people waiting to get actual baptized into the order. And they were playing all the Zion songs. There was clothing everywhere. Everything was white. There was white tights, white socks. There was people who were really happy and smiling and people who were just dead inside. I started asking where mom was and, and where my, my younger sister was and, you know, I was a little shocked and confused because I knew, I knew my mom and I knew my younger sister and, and they were really good people. And I just couldn't understand why they wouldn't be accepted. And Honestly, I think the United Order is just a joke. Just a sick, disgusting joke to pull families apart. And honestly, that's why we even came out in the first place, is because I was gonna be separated from her and my mom. And I just couldn't do that. We had tried to leave two times before, and the first time was when we went to our caretaker. It told us we'd be, yes, it was our choice to leave, but if we left, then we would be raped and used up. And honestly, at the time, I thought, well, being raped and used up doesn't sound too bad. I mean, I had my sisters praying to die, and my mom about to lose her mind, and we left. We didn't take nothing. Yeah, I lived here when I was little, but it was a lot different than it is now. Like, there were three wives that lived here. Um, one of them had 12 kids. One of them had 13, and my mom had 14 kids. One of these rooms used to be the baby room that mom had for her kids, but it leaked. Whenever Mother Anne flushed her toilet, then it would leak down the wall, and there was mold and mice just everywhere down here. And there was cockroaches, and when you went to bed, then you could feel the mice like nibbling on your hair. It was gross. And you could see up into the study, and that's where the big girls used to comb their hair. And I guess at first, then, like, the town was combing their hair in like a different way. And then all of a sudden, they came out with these hairstyles and this lady would come and teach you how to do your hair. And all the big girls took that class and learned how to comb their hair. These two, this is when I was about five, I think. <laughs> and this is a picture of our dad, actually, when he was younger. We always knew we would get married at some point, but... We, we kind of talked about it, like, you know, kind of jokingly or like, who would you marry or, you know. And then we like, we try and be mean to each other and like put our names with like people we didn't like. There was actually one parent who named their boys North, South, East, and West. <laughs> <laughs> there was this one kid who was named Denim Levi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as we got older, I think we started getting a little more afraid, so we didn't talk about it as much. So 
beautiful is the one on the corner. It's that big house on the corner. We lived in the, the half of it, the tall part. This is it right here. Yeah, I'm trying to get Warren's house. I want to put, you know, I want to live in there, and I also want to put some businesses in there so it'll pay for itself. I lived in this house for like four months. Oh, they weren't very good times. I was kind of confused. And we were always taught they were after us. The world was after us. They wanted to get us and break our faith. They wanted to take our virtue and just even kill us, you know. They lock up a lot of people. They locked me up. I tried to run away on the streets. People would call and tell them, you know, that I was running. My brother would show up and you know, yell at me, and I, I didn't have a choice but to come back. And eventually they locked me up with two screws in the window and the doorknob turned on backwards. And I found some scissors and unscrewed one side, and then I started pounding on the other side until it broke off. I just hopped out and ran away. I didn't, I didn't take anything with me because I didn't think I'd be, you know, even make it, you know. I took back roads, went through the creek, went over to a house that I knew was people that were on the outside. So before the end of the day, I was um, completely out of this town. Right after I got baptized into the United Order, when you when you're in the UO, you're supposed to fill this out every night, along with write a journal of what you did to bless other people. In detail, isn't it? Yeah, yeah in detail. Yeah. Well, no offense to Michelle, but when she went in to get her interview, the only reason she was not picked was because she was heavy. I guarantee you that was the reason. I cleaned every week that house from top to bottom because they told me I was supposed to. And no one would help me. They would all look away, you know, go away when I go in their room and start cleaning. They were all alienating her, and none of them could say anything to her. So she'd just lay on her bed and cry, and Ada told me, I could hear Michelle over there crying, but I couldn't get up and go over and say, hey, Shelly, you want to talk about it? Or, you know, because she was in the UO, she couldn't talk to her. And my sister wife was asking her every day, are you doing what they said? You're not talking to Michelle, are you? You know, so she had, she had a monitor right there in the home so she couldn't, couldn't go talk oh, to her. I'm surprised they left in the I would room. walk in a room and Ada would walk out. That's so sad. Yeah. PTSD is like what soldiers get when they've been through traumatic things. I have PTSD. The way that they taught us to pray is actually building brainwaves through the mind, and it's it's making people go handicapped. It was a long path of recovery, fighting those triggers and what was real, you know. I'm just glad that they caught him eventually. <laughs> come up here and walk around the reservoir too when I was like 13, 14, 15. And you can't really get lost here, so you just walk and walk and walk until <laughs> you get tired. I had a lot of bad memories here, but I also had a lot of good ones. And that I can come down here now and, you know, it won't be so foreboding anymore. Like, more and more that foreboding feeling, that depressing feeling is going away. But I can see why some people will want to go away and never come back, though. Because for how bad I had it, I actually had it really, really good in there. Like, at least I wasn't a Jeffs and, you know, made to live in that 
fortress. I'm trapped. 